We are gonna start a brand new series about a book of the Bible that for a lot of people that read the Bible, this is their favorite book. This series is gonna be called The Other Brother, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. Um, But we're gonna look for the next several weeks, and to be honest with you, I don't know when this series is going to end. I know that we're gonna do something around the Easter time that'll be different, but I don't know that we're not gonna have to jump back into this book because I can't rush through this book. And I can't rush through the things the Lord is speaking to my heart about to share with you guys. Um, We're gonna look at the book of James. So the reason we're calling it the the other brothers because I don't know how many of you guys know who wrote the book of James? Yeah, James. Good job, everybody. Very good. Very good. If you said Paul, I was gonna quit. All right, I was gonna quit. And so it is James, but you have to ask yourself which James, because if you don't know, there are four Jameses in the New Testament. Um, There are two Jameses that are disciples. There's James, the brother of John. Then there's another James. I love the way the Bible refers to the second James. The Bible calls him in the book of Mark, the lesser James. Come on, somebody. How many of you would like to be that guy? I'm the lesser James. And so then there's the lesser James, and then there's James, the father of Judas. Now, we know none of these are the ones that wrote the book of James, because some of those were already dead by the time that James was written. And then James, the father of Judas, was not a disciple, so it would not have been taken by the disciples as authoritative in the New Testament church. So that breaks it down to the only other person it could be is James, the half-brother of Jesus. So we just did a series called Short and Stout, where we looked at the book of Jude. So I thought, let's look at the other brother now. Jude was one chapter that's full of very powerful stuff, but let's look at the other brother and let's see what James has to say. Um, there's a lot that I could tell you about the history of James. For sake of time, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to, I was going to lay a lot of foundation. I'm not going to lay a lot of foundation. This is what I'll tell you. The book of James was written in the 40s, not the 1940s, the 40s, 40s. Um, and this was like right after Jesus died. Jesus has just died. Now, if you don't know, just like Jude, James did not believe in Jesus. James was not a believer at all. In fact, James took it a step further than Jude did that when James grew up with Jesus, how crazy is this? This is the truth. That when Jesus was in the middle of his three years of ministry, James tried to have Jesus institutionalized. Come on, somebody. How many of you got a brother or sister like that, right? Had tried, literally tried to have him institutionalized And then Jesus plays one more card. I mean, you gotta remember, James grew up with Jesus. So every time Jesus is doing something to heal somebody, James is like, man, I've seen this before. Like, I've seen this. But he plays one more card that buys James in. Do you know what that card that Jesus played that makes James buy in? Resurrection. Yeah, that'll work, okay? If your brother dies, all right, and then he comes back and then he wants to sit down and have fish with you around a fire, You buy into him a little bit. And so it was at the resurrection. So that just tells me, listen, guys, if you're here and you're not a believer, maybe you grew up in church, maybe you grew up around church, maybe you don't know anything about church, but you're not a believer, the beautiful thing about James and Jude show us is it doesn't matter how far you are away from God. Listen, you're not too far. You're not too far. He could draw you in. So James ends up becoming a believer and James writes this book. He writes this book At a time, you gotta remember, in Acts 7, there was this moment where they stoned Stephen and the church dispersed. The church went out from that and they went all over the world because they were so fearful. I am of the opinion, let me give you a prophetic word from your pastor. I am of the opinion that we are living in a culture of dispersion. We are living in a time and day right now where culture is against the church just like it was, that's one of the reasons I feel so pressed in my spirit to talk to you out of the book of James because he's writing to a group of people that have went all over the world because culture is against them. They are fearful to stand up and be who God has called them to be. So it's the voice of James that speaks up in a moment of dispersion. And he says, guys, we have to mature and we've got to be the church. That's what James tells them. And I feel that in my spirit right now, that one of the things God is doing in this movement is he is trying to communicate to a church that has been dispersed in culture. And he's trying to bring them back to the reality of who he is and who they are in him. And so James writes this to a group of people who have ran, who have fled, 
Now, you got to remember how James died just to show you how much he believed in that. Now, this for me is a proof that the Bible is true. This is proof that Jesus is who he said he was because, it, listen, I'm just going to be real. How many of y'all grew up like, with a perfect brother or sister like I did? Come on, raise your hand. Yeah. I know. They think they're perfect and they ain't, right? They ain't. You, you grow up with Jesus if there was anybody that was not going to buy into Jesus being the son of God, don't you think the brother would have? And do you know how James died? James died, he was a martyr. They took him on top of a temple and they threw him off the temple and it didn't kill him, he lived through it. So a guy picked up a stick off the side of the road and beat him to death. And while they were beating James to death, he was praying that God would save their life. Now, if somebody like that, that grew up with Jesus is gonna buy into Jesus, you better believe I'm gonna buy into Jesus. James is a general epistle. It is not written to a specific church. It is written to the church around the world. And we're gonna look at what James has to say. And I'm gonna have to run, 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 because the last point, if I don't get to the last point, I'll stop because I can't rush through it. It's the meat of what I have to say. But let's look. And over the next several weeks, it only takes 15 minutes to read the book of James from start to finish. So if you wanna read it, go read it. It's only five chapters, it's not long. 15 minutes, we can read the whole thing. Over the next several weeks, we're going to read every verse. That's one of the reasons it's probably gonna take me a little while because we're gonna go verse by verse. And so I don't wanna rush through it. We're gonna start in chapter one of verse one and let's read down through it and see what he says. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. In other words, you've been dispersed. I'm fixing to give you a word. It says, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What, what a start to the letter, right? Is that a great greeting or what? Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, we just did a, series, a sermon about this, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna dig in too deep to this. We just talked about that our pain produces. We just talked about the process of pain, but he says here that you are going to go through some stuff, and you gotta like the way that he wrote it because they said it's gonna be a lot of stuff. He says, in some translations, it says days. So it's like not one day, but plural and he says, not only days, but, but, but then you look at him and you go, yeah, but what kind of stuff are we talking about? Like, is it easy stuff? Is it hard stuff? And James, what does he say? Various kinds. <laughs> Various, yeah. You're gonna wanna get out of your marriage because you're gonna hate her. You're gonna wanna kill your kids because you hate them. You're gonna wanna kill your boss because you're gonna hate your job. There's various kinds, right? There's all these things that you're gonna go through that all of us are going to deal with. And you know what, it's amazing because sometimes we have to say yes to some things from God that are for our joy and not for our happiness. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody have kids? Yeah? How many of you, do your kids ask you to do stuff sometimes that it's not for your happiness? But you do know it's gonna create a memory that you will be able to say is a joyful thing, right? You know. That's, that's what I have to do with my kids all the time. It's like, listen, I'm gonna say yes, but it's not because I wanna do this. It's because I know there's gonna be something good that comes out of it that one day I'm gonna look back and I'm gonna say, I'm glad I did it, but it's not gonna happen while I'm doing it. That's what he's talking about right here. He says, you're gonna go through some stuff. You're not gonna like it while you're going through it. And you know, early in my Christian life, this has been my experience as, as I've grown in my faith. Early in my Christian life, I have always enjoyed going to the passages where David kills Goliath and God shuts the mouth of the lion, right? And you read these stories and it's so exciting. But you know what? The, the older I've gotten and the more that I've gotten into the word, you know, what, you know what passages mean the most to me now? The ones that say, I consider it pure joy to face trials of various kinds because I know that God will use those things to produce something. I love that. I love that. Trials in your life if you wanna write something down. And let me just tell you, I'm gonna give you some stuff today that I think is gonna change your life. If you don't normally take notes, number one, you're more likely going to hell. <laughs> number two, um, there is a card in front of you. Pull that out. 
and write down some of these things. I'm gonna give you some things today that you're not gonna wanna forget. So use one of those new cards and write down some of these notes. Your trials are a pathway to maturity. You need to know that. I think sometimes we think that our maturity in Christ is gonna come because he sprinkles pixie dust on us and we're just gonna be mature. That's not how it works. If you're going to mature in Christ, guess what? You're gonna have to go through some stuff. I'm sorry to tell you. He's not gonna sprinkle pixie dust all over your life and then you're gonna say, we can fly, we can fly, we can fly. It's not how it's gonna happen. You're gonna have to go through some trials in your life, but if you will allow yourself to go through this, those things with the strength of God, he will use those things to strengthen you. So let's keep reading verse four. This is where we're gonna take a break for a second. Verse four, let perseverance finish its work. See, that's what we don't like to do. We don't like to let it finish its work. If we go through a trial, we want it to be quick and easy, don't we? If we go through a struggle, we want it to be quick and easy. But he says, let the, let the perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Listen to what he says, not lacking anything. Point number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Learn to live without lack. And I can only do that if I mature. There is a life that you can live in Jesus. Listen, if you're here right now and you are living with a mentality of lack, there is a place of maturity you can get where you do not lack anything. Now listen to me. I figure you want a good line to tweet? You ready? Just because you don't lack anything does not mean you get everything. Ooh, Good word. I'm gonna talk to you in just a minute while I say that to myself sometimes. I'm gonna explain it because I've never explained it, so I'm gonna explain it. Just because you live without lack and you lack nothing does not mean that you get everything. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not the point. The point is, is I can mature in him where I live a life that is without lack, no matter where I find myself. How did Paul say it? He says, no matter where I find myself, I can be content. I've been hungry and I've been full. I've been clothed and then I haven't had clothes. And then I've been housed and I haven't had houses. And in all of it, I've been able to be thankful and grateful and trust in what the Lord is doing. Now we remember that in Hebrews chapter six, verse one, it says, let us therefore uh, uh, move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Look at your neighbor and say, grow up. Come on. Some of y'all been wanting to tell them that. Some of y'all wives been wanting to tell your husband, grow up. Grow up. It is time for us to grow up. And you know what? I, I am ready for the church to celebrate growth as much as they celebrate conversion. There are so many churches that will celebrate conversion, but they do not celebrate growth. That's why we call it next steps here because we want you to take that next step. And how many of you remember when your kids were trying to walk, what would happen? They would take a step and they'd fall down. And most churches want to focus on the fact they'll say they didn't walk, they fell. You want to say, you look at it like you want to look at it. We're going to look at it like we want to look at it because in my eyes, they were walking. And they might have fallen, but they still took a step. And when they say those first words, how many of y'all remember when somebody that you was like your friend, it wasn't your kid, and they were like, listen to what they said, and then they talk and they go, ar, ar, ar. and you, did you hear that? And you want to go, no, I didn't. And they said, they said, hi, mom, how are you? <laughs> like, that's what they just said, right? We're going to, we have to celebrate growth. We have to celebrate it in one another. When we see somebody take a step, even if they fall down, just say, hey, good job, you took a step. Now let's get up and let's take another step and let's keep moving forward. That's what the Bible is teaching us here, that we have to be people that know how to mature. And people ask me all the time, how do I mature? Paul tells us in Philippians chapter three, verses three to eight, I'm not gonna read it, but I'm gonna paraphrase it in one sentence. Paul says, how do you mature? With Jesus. I mature with Jesus. 
Paul gives this whole list of things of what things you would think would mature someone. I went to school. I learned how to be a good Jewish boy. I learned the law of Moses and I learned how to live the law of Moses. And then Paul says, but all of that was nothing. What I had to do is I had to walk with Jesus. That's where maturity comes from. But how do I know that? You want me to prove it to you? Because that's what Jesus said he did. When they would ask Jesus, why did you do this? How did you do this? How would Jesus respond? I only do what I see my father in heaven doing. And my father is the mature son. And if I'm going to imitate him, then that will walk me into maturity. That's how Jesus did it. So now we are the body of Christ. So guess what that means for us? How do we mature? We look at Jesus. And if Jesus did it, guess what? We do it. And if Jesus didn't do it, then we don't have to do it. I mean, people ask me all the time. I mean, I know everybody here is from a different background. Why do you like laying hands on people? Jesus did it. I spit and made mud in my hand one time and put it on Brandy's eyes on the stage. Why'd you do that? Jesus did it. If we see Jesus do it, let's do it. That's how you mature. You focus on the person of Jesus. Now there's a question. How is it that I can measure my spiritual maturity? Again, I'm I'm really rushing through these points to get to the last one because there's more I could say about this. But how do I measure my spiritual maturity? If you want to know right now, if you are spiritually mature, let me give you three things that you can ask yourself. And they're all found out of Hebrews chapter five, verse number 12. It says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. This passage gives us three tests about to see, okay, am I mature? Number one, the first question that you ask is, am I a consumer or am I a producer? When you shift, listen to me, I'm fixing to, if you write this down, (laughs) write this down. Don't ever forget this. The moment you shift from being a consumer to being a producer is the moment you leave a life of lack. Come Come on, thank you. As long as I am a consumer, there will always be lack. I will always be in need. But the moment that I realize what God has put on the inside of me, what God has put on the inside of you, is not to have to rely on everybody else all the time, but you are a producer for the kingdom of God. And if you will step into your identity as a producer for God, you will never have lack. As long as I can produce, lack cannot exist. Amen? And he tells them, he says, listen, guys, you ought to be teachers. You ought to be producing. But instead, you're still needing people to feed you. I could say things so inappropriate right now. (laughs) And I'm just going to leave it alone because I've done good so far. Other than told you you were going to hell if you don't take notes. Other than that, I've been really behaving. I've been doing really good. So are you a consumer or are you a producer? If you are still a consumer, you are living in lack. Number two, the second thing that he tells us, he says, am I drinking milk or am I eating meat? Everybody says, there you go. You know, I mean, this is the option, guys. I want you to look at me. This is the option. Come on, somebody. (laughs) What do you want? Which do you want? I thought last week, man, everybody texted me about ribs after church last week. So I said, I think I've hit a nerve. I think I found something I can communicate with, and it's meat. (laughs) Because none of us, none of us want to live our life on this. You don't want to live on a bottle with milk. And I've always told you, listen, I'm not going to rehash it. Milk is pre-digested food. That means the nourishment's that are from the meat are not in the milk. This is baby stuff. That's why we can't survive on milk. We can't continue to live on milk because it is pre-digested food. 
Everything that I give you on a Sunday, while I think it is valuable, it is more valuable to me than it is to you because I digest it. And while it is important for you to hear from me, it is not nearly as important as you learning how to not live on lack and take pre-digested food, but understand, he's called me to meat. Amen? This is a brisket, ladies and gentlemen. This is gold. That's what this is. This is good stuff. I mean, I don't know what person in their right mind would be offered a brisket and milk, and they go, I think I'll take the milk. You have to grow out of this milk thing where the only thing that you have in your life is pre-digested food and you've got to get back to knowing there is a maturity where I can partake of meat. And that's where there's no lack because all the nutrients are there. You're not missing anything. And then the third thing that he says in the same passage is he says, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to discern. Number, number three, am I able to discern? Because a lot of your lack is not lack, it is lack of discernment. It's not that there's a real lack in what you have or don't have. It's that you aren't discerning what the Lord is doing or what the Lord is saying and whatever it is that you are going through. Amen? Amen. I had to rush through that. Let's go back to James. Let's go back. Let me tell you this about maturity. Show me one thing in creation that God did not design to mature and grow. Doesn't exist. Everything that God designed, everything that God created was designed to grow and mature. So are we. So are we. Let's keep reading. Verse five, go back to verse five. Of, of James chapter one. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives you generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. You know what? The question is not, are you asking? I, th I think this is one of the most profound things the Bible teaches us about the concept of asking. Asking is a good thing. But the question I wanna ask you is, everybody listen to me. What are you asking for? Are you asking for something you don't have the ability to manage or sustain? So I don't need to ask God for every little thing that I want. I don't need to say, God, send me a girl because I'm ready to get married. The question is, do I have the wisdom to make a marriage work and I don't need to ask for a girl I need to ask for wisdom people say I need some money not if you're bad with money no you don't that's the worst thing I could give you if you're bad with money so I don't go to God and say God give me money I go to God and I say God give me wisdom because I know if you give me wisdom I can take what you give me in money and I can do something worthwhile with it amen are you hearing me so don't just ask for things, know what you're asking for. Let's go back to Timothy, verse six. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not, be expect, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. He says, let me ask. But when I ask, I got to make sure I actually expect God to give me what I ask. There has to be expectation. So James tells us to pray two prayers here. Number one, he says, pray, grant me wisdom. That's, that's the first prayer. Grant me wisdom. Give me wisdom in everything that I have. Number two, kill my doubt. Because a, a double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. And I know what you're thinking. Does that mean I'm not allowed to doubt? No, no, no. You're going to have doubts try to come in. But what you've got to do is you've got to do like the man who had the son that was demon-possessed. And you've got to go to Jesus. And you've got to say, okay, I believe that you're able to. But help me overcome my unbelief. Do you know that when doubt tries to come in, if you will go to God and say, God, there's some doubt trying to creep into my life. Do you know that if you go to him and you have faith in him and say, God, will you give me some, something in my life that is not doubt? Do you know God is faithful to take the doubt out of your life and replace it with faith? But a lot of people, what they choose to do is they just choose to stay in doubt. They just choose to stay in unbelief. And then they wonder why it never happens. They, they wonder why, okay, why isn't God doing anything? Well, it's because you're double-minded. 
And I've got to go to God and say, like the man, and say, listen, help my unbelief. I don't want to be unstable. Verse 9 says, believers in humble circumstances ought to take their pride in their high position, but the rich should take their pride in humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and, right, and withers the plant. It blossoms, its blossoms falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. I'm safe then in Jesus' name. There we go. Verse 12, it says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, he says in verse 13, no one should say God, God is tempting me. Me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person, listen, is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Number two, if you're taking notes, stop dying. Look at your neighbor and say, stop dying. Stop dying. The Bible is literally giving you the answer to the sin in your life. Apart from the fact, now one of the things that's interesting about the book of James that I did not mention is the name of Jesus is only mentioned twice in the whole book. And it is not a theological book, it is a practical book. It is not like Paul where he gives long dissertations about, about salvation and about the cross and about righteousness. And then Paul will say, therefore, and then he'll give you a little practical nugget based on what he just told you. The book of James is not like that. The book of James is practical. It's like the book of Proverbs. It just punches you in the gut every line that you read. And you've been a Christian for 175 years and you thought you was doing good. And then you read the book of James and you're like, oh, dang, I ain't doing as good as I thought I was. Man, I thought I, I thought I was doing good. Then James lets you know, no, there's a lot of maturing that we need to do. And he makes it very practical. And he's not talking about the overwhelming theological idea of sin all throughout Scripture where, where you owed this debt and then Christ paid that debt on the cross. He doesn't mention the cross. He doesn't mention the resurrection. He never mentions the work of the Holy Spirit and the whole book of James. He makes it practical. He says, listen, guys, don't you understand the process? He says, there is a process to sin. Everybody has it, by the way. Come on, I, 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 haven't, I haven't talked about it in a long time. Let's talk about it again. The church is full of people who wear Spanx, both literally and figuratively. We try to cover this stuff up, and instead of getting ourselves back in shape, we just wrap that junk up and tighten it up, and then if we put our dress on, we look good. And James says, that ain't gonna work because if you wear Spanx every day, you gonna die. That's what he tells them. You and all the women, I said the women are going, yeah, it's true, it's true, it's true. You're going to die. You can't just go keep doing that. He says, there is a process, guys. The Bible tells us the process. He first, he talks about what? He says, there is temptation. Now, just so you know, listen to me, church. Temptation is not a sin. And the devil makes you feel like it is. Temptation is not sin. But what we have to do is we have to learn that when we see temptation coming down the hallway, I'm gonna have to stop here, so I'm just gonna take some time. We ain't gonna get to point number three. We'll get it next week because that's the most important one. When temptation's coming down the hallway, you need to be able to see it. And you gotta be able to deal with it when it's coming down the hallway before it ever gets close to you. Listen, how great could our church services be if people didn't come in with the shame and guilt of all of the sin in their life? every Sunday because they didn't deal with it at temptation. They waited until it gave birth. And now I gotta deal with it when I get to church. We have to, have to know when temptation is heading our way and we've gotta say, listen, I'm gonna deal with you there. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it reminds us what? That there is not one temptation that has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. No temptation. There is, see, see, this is that verse that everybody misquotes. Everybody says, God won't give me more than I can handle. You're a liar. That's not true. That's not what it says. It says that he will not tempt you. 
I face things every day that I can't handle. I need him. That's why it's in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. But he does tell me that there is no temptation in your life that you can't overcome. No temptation. That word overtake, you want me to give you an interesting, you want me to give you, a, now, now we'll get a little deeper. You know, what, you know what Greek word that is? Dunamis. Do you know what dunamis is? It's the same word that is translated power in every passage of scripture where the word power is used, including in Acts chapter two, when it talks about the power, when it talks about in Acts chapter one, when Jesus says, I will give you power. You will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, to the ends of the earth. It's the same word. Did you know that on the inside of you, you have the power on the inside of you to deal with temptation? It's in you. You've got to learn to deal with it. Blame is a word that we do in the church all the time. Blame, blame is a way of escape. If we can find something to blame it on, the devil made me do it. Right? All the way back in the garden from the beginning, it was always about blame. God comes in the garden. What happened? You gave me this woman. That's what happened. So we've got now, listen, just like Adam did, we've got now, we're no longer, there was a day in the church where people blamed the devil for everything. Do you know what we do more now than that? We blame God more than we blame the devil. God made me this way. How many of you have heard that? About some area of somebody's life, this is just the way I am, this is the way I'm wired. He's blaming and what we're really wanting to do is we're really wanting somebody in the church to wrap their arms around us and hug us and say, it's okay, it's not your fault. But James tells us, it is your fault. <laughs> it is your fault. You didn't recognize temptation. You didn't recognize the beginning of a process He goes on and he says what? He says, then it, it starts as a desire. Not sin, just as a desire. It's not sin. The sin that drags you away, listen to me, and dad, you come on up. The sin that drags you away, it is not an outside force. James tells us it connects with something that is on the inside of you. That's why it's something that has to die. Connects with something on the inside of me. He says, there's something on the inside of me and there's this desire. And that's why for the church, listen, that's why for the church, we pick and choose what things that we talk about in other people's lives. Because if it's a desire that we have, if it's on the inside of me, I don't address it. But if it's not one that I deal with, I love to talk about it. I'll be glad to have a sin conversation with you. After he says this, he says it starts as a desire and then it is enticing because you continue to let it grow. And what happens is, it's exactly what the Bible tells us. It says that there is something on the inside of you. There's something on the inside of you that is a sin that, eager, that easily entangles you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We all have it. Everybody in this room, you've got a sin that easily entangles you. It's that thing that entices you. And you continue to let it stay there. And then, after you let it stay there, it leads to death. Because you allowed that thing to continue to grow. So, so what happens is, is, Instead of growing in him, you grow in sin. And growing in him leads to life, but growing in sin leads to death. And if, if, if milk is the immature Christian and the meat is the mature Christian, then sin How many of you had kids that didn't want to let this joker go? Come on. 
Some of y'all did that mean stuff, put hot sauce on it and all that stuff. <laughs> all y'all young parents, we got some tips for you if you want us to help you out. So what happens is, guys, is instead of going from milk to meat, we put something in our mouth that literally has no nourishment. See, this is why it kills you. It has no nourishment. And you just hold it and you keep it. It feels so good. It feels so comfortable. But there is no nourishment that comes out of it. And because you keep this, you die. See, some of you right now, you don't want to admit it, man, but your marriage is falling apart. And at the end of the day, it really is because sin is there. And I love you too much as your pastor to not just to not tell you. Some of you, your jobs are falling apart. And it's not because you're just unlucky. It's because you got sin in your life and you won't let God deal with it. You know, the, the, the struggle is real. The struggle that Paul talks about in Romans 7 is very real where he talks about that there is this battle on the inside of us. You remember this section? So in Romans 6, Paul tells us, you've died to sin, but I'm sorry to tell you, it's still a battle that you're gonna still fight. And then by the time we get to Romans 7, that's when Paul tells us that passage where it says, man, I know what I ought to do and I don't do it. And then I know what I shouldn't do. And that's what I do. And it's awful. It's a frustrating dynamic in my life. And at the end, he says, Paul says, what a wretched man am I? You remember that? Who can deliver me from this sin? And then Paul answers, thanks be to Christ Jesus. Thanks be to Christ Jesus. You can't let it grow, guys. Because if it grows, you die. But you know what's beautiful? If I grow, it dies. If I grow in him, it dies. James has some hard stuff in the beginning here about trials, if you're going through trials. Hard stuff about maturing and letting you know you've gotta grow. Hard stuff about sin, letting you know. Don't, don't, don't wait on somebody to wrap their arms around you today and say it's not your fault. Let Jesus deal with it in your life.